without pandering to national stereotypes. I've took you take my breath quite literally, and you'll get no poetry for me, I'm afraid. It'll be a, a lot drier than Dowra. Um, I thought I'd provide a little bit of background to why the, some of the, well, when I come on to think of the data we've been using in developing, why we're using those, um, how we got there. Uh, so, prior to devolution and the subsequent uh, developments of the, kind of the current cap, Historic Scotland sat as a government agency under the Culture Minister. Agricultural and uh, Rural Policy sat under a different minister and there was very little communication between the two and very little alignment of priorities. Uh, in 2012, the Scottish Government announced its plans to merge Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission for Ancient and Historical Monuments. This resulted in 2015 in the creation of a new non-departmental public body out with government but still answerable to the Minister of Culture. We are tasked by Scottish ministers to become the lead body in regard to the historic environment. This process also resulted in 2014 with the publication of Our Place and Time which set out the uh, Scottish Government's strategy for the historic environment. This remains the Scottish Government's main statement of planning out, uh, for this, on the historic environment outside of planning. One of the main tenets of OPIT, as it's become known, is the, um, the concept of mainstreaming, ensuring the historic environment remains at the heart of a modern, dynamic Scotland, and it's, it's embedded within policy making across the Scottish Government. Initially, it was adopted by many Scottish uh, government departments and it came towards the finalisation of the last SRDP programme which underpinned, which was underpinned by years of previous kind of natural heritage research and mapping. So we had a very short window to try and get the historic environment incorporated within that. Uh, we managed to persuade the programme team that we could provide prioritised data, mappable data and that any results could then be demonstrated. This resulted in the inclusion of a nationally important, uh, the inclusion of nationally important scheduled monuments within the aims of the Scottish Rural Development Programme under Pillar Two of the EU Common Agricultural Policy, but nearly wholly restricted to where historic environment outcomes were complemented uh, by natural historic of natural environment ones. Um, the ability to measure success was demonstrated through data collected through our pre-existing field officer programme which I'll discuss a little bit more in a few minutes. Oh, I've jumped ahead somewhere. There we go. Uh, on this map, you can see where a farmer has proposed to convert um, his farm into organic farming, putting hedges marked by the black lines and uh, double fences marked by the red dotted lines across the schedule line, which is the, the red area there. So there's, there's some clear benefits for the historic environment there and obviously some clear conflicts which we've got. Once we, we provide advice to the, um, the rural development officers and any benefits to the monument is added to the waiting to the potential for a successful, successful grant application. As we move forward, the ability to sustain mainstreaming is faded. Maintaining a dialogue with and the willingness of Scottish Government departments to continue to consider the historic environment is now proving quite challenging, to say the least. Nevertheless, as we move towards a new agricultural scheme, mm. There's a fresh opportunity to work with colleagues from across the regulatory spectrum and present new evidence of the impacts current land uses have on the historic environment and on the success or otherwise of the existing programme in order to in future, inform future decision making. Obtaining data from the grant awarding departments on which schemes have been, which we which schemes we have commented on, and which ones our advice has been taken on board, this has also proved problematic. However, we can continue to provide data on the changing condition of scheduled monuments. And this is largely achieved through our field officer programme. This programme has been operating since 1999, previously kind of called our um, Monument Warden programme, meaning that we have over 20 years of data background. Our aspiration is to visit every monument over a five year, to five to 10 year cycle, and it's prioritised and risk. We're increasing this specifically where um, we think um, Monuments group may have been affected by their agricultural and environment schemes. As well as a written assessment, each monument is given a score out of five based on um, condition and risk. And these figures 
figures allow us to monitor change over time and the success or otherwise of the management regimes. Data on the success is still of the current scheme has been collated, but uh, a number of trends are becoming apparent. Overall, we're witnessing a decline in the condition of 21% of our monuments. This is particularly pronounced in standing masonry buildings, especially those in the southwest of Scotland. And standing buildings have pro proven particularly vulnerable to climate change and increased wetness, which is uh, affecting very much that part of Scotland. Um, forestry is also proving to be one of the greatest threats to monuments of all kinds. Crop marks don't seem particularly under threat, but this is likely to be a cause of our methodologies and our, uh, for, kind of for recording, and we'll hopefully we'll try to turn that on its head and re redress that. Um, over the last few years, we've developed new sources of data which we hope will inform future programmes. Ongoing, ongoing aerial photo photography sorry, over many years is also allowing us to begin to demonstrate the impact of soil erosion over scheduled crop marks, as well as helping us gain access to information about wellhead condition on standing masonry monuments. We've also finalised our historic land use assessment for the whole of Scotland, which has taken quite a long time for us to get there. This maps relics and historic landscape types and allows us to monitor the contribution to modern landscapes. This data is also very useful in a number of other ways. Um, HLA allows us to quantify the relic resource and to say something about its distribution and current management. Here we can see the distribution of Roman military land use. No, we can't on. Uh, we can quantify it and therefore we can monitor it. And we know that how these locations are being managed. So we can say with a certain amount of confidence that in this example, over three quarters of this resource is under active cultivation within modern, modern rectilinear fields. We can also compare this past, present and past mapping of land use to make observations about how land use has changed, comparing HLA with Ordnance Survey map data from the 1930s, we can see an expansion of places like Dunfermline. This urban expansion most likely influenced by the building of the, of the fourth road bridge in the 1960s. And here we can see the impact of over 80 years of forestry policy in the southwest of Scotland. Using ordnance data and forestry and energy mapping, automated processes have been developed to highlight possible areas of land use change. These areas are then peer reviewed by members of the HLA team they are able to update the HLA over a three-year cycle, enabling us to give statistics and kind of change to relevant more landscape types. The mapping update is complemented by a, kind of another a monitoring photography program, where a selection of land use locations will have aerial and ground photography taken during each updated cycle. The aim is to provide a set of case studies that can be used to visualise future discussions and land use change. This is what HES is carrying out in partnership with SNH of Scottish Natural Heritage, which is our sister or brother body uh, who deal with the natural heritage. In addition, SNH have been given access to the HES site's database, Canmore, to help them enable to help enable them to produce case studies of past land use change using ATS's collection of data of historical photography. One of the areas where we've had particular success over the last few years is on the front of, of landscapes, and particularly in partnership with SNH and assisted by the HLA data. This takes its lead from the Scottish Government's National Planning Framework and the recently published Landscape and the Historic Environment Common Statement which both take the lead from the European Landscape Convention, which has hitherto been resisted by within Scottish politics. Both take quite a progressive approach and recognise both the historic and natural environment's contribution to landscape and our communities. We've we helped we use this as well to kind of help revise and ensure the historic environment is embedded into the 366 landscape types for Scotland which has allowed us to contribute to landscape characterisation, which also informs kind of planning and land use decisions. In turn, this allows us to take a fresh look at existing landscape designations and policies, which have 
well, into existing landscape designations and policies which all have their hooks for considering the aquatic environment, but which to date have been largely ignored. And so that's largely our fault as an organisation, but I think that's it's quite a positive change. This is also encouraging rural researchers to think about how to embed the historic environment into ecosystem services and approaches to natural capital. This is, for us, it's never really proved a natural fit, but um, we can make a few tentative steps. You'll see this is by the Hutton Institute rather than by ourselves. Um, They, they kind of, they're developing kind of various different kinds of algorithms to think about kind of a time depth and kind of the concentration of different kinds of designations. It, the results are a bit, oop, sorry, there you go. They're a bit skewed, but it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's a nice first step. Um, and I think we'll... I think it's positive in the fact that we can kind of bring it together. It's, we've got a positive dialogue and we can build on from there. I'm looking forward to Vince's talk about how <laughs> Other areas can bring that forward. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much.